I was just watching a lecture by Harry Collins called Knowledge Institutions, Free Expression and Democracy. It's available on YouTube. And he said some things that have some interesting implications for philosophy of science. One of the things that philosophy of science is for, according to many philosophers of science, you know, one of the things that it can do uh, is, is sort of extend scientific knowledge. So uh, philosophers of science can kind of work together with scientists to help resolve scientific problems. Uh, so within the philosophy of biology, for example, there are philosophers of science who you know, work on uh, you know, the levels of selection debate or the species problem or uh, the concept of innateness or the concept of biological individuality, um, you know, the concept of adaptationism. Um, it, so, so these are, are problems that biologists deal with and philosophers of science often think that they can help resolve those problems. And I've got actually videos on many of these topics on my channel. I mean, you know, if you're interested in the philosophical approach to these problems, uh, I guess the thought is that although these may be empirical problems, um, you know, that there are empirical questions related to innateness, there are also a lot of conceptual issues there and philosophers can help resolve those conceptual issues. Plus, we've seen the emergence of things like scientific metaphysics or naturalistic metaphysics, which involves the uh, uh, the, the application of science to answer metaphysical questions, you know, questions about causality, reductionism, emergence, etc. Um, now, I should say, you know, I'm kind of sceptical of all of these sorts of projects anyway, since uh, I think all of these projects assume a kind of scientific realism, and I don't accept scientific realism. Um, but Collins, uh, in his lecture, I think, raised a slightly different sort of problem to, uh, f for any project like this. So what Collins says is that in order to understand a field, uh, to the extent, you know, in order to understand a field, to have the level of understanding that would be required to actually contribute to problem solving within that field, you need to have what he calls interactional expertise. And... And interactional expertise arises from, you know, working in a community over many years, interacting with other experts, um, you know, le learning to speak their language, performing experiments, you know, if, if you're a scientist, right? So, you know, actually having this kind of practical knowledge, practical understanding of performing experiments. Um, I mean, the, the point is that for Collins, a great deal of scientific knowledge is tacit knowledge. It's a matter of skills and abilities that can't really be, you can't sort of explicitly verbalize them. You can't s spell them out in explicit rules. So you can't learn science by, you know, picking up a scientific textbook or reading scientific sources. You actually have to be immersed in the scientific community for a, a long period of time. And, and in particular, I mean, so, so Collins explicitly says that um, what he calls primary source knowledge so the knowledge that you would get from you know, reading scientific journals, that's not enough, actually. That's, that's not enough to really understand science. Um, he gives the example, uh, like his work was in the gravitational wave uh, community. So he's a sociologist of science who worked uh, with uh, gravitational wave scientists for, for many decades. And he gives this example of a paper by uh, a scientist called Joe Weber. Um, and it was published in the uh, early 90s, I think. Now, Weber had done research on gravitational waves in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and this paper, uh, Collins said, it, you know, it looked like a perfectly respectable paper. It looked like it followed all of the norms, all of the methods of science, all of that. Um, but actually, no, nobody took it seriously. Uh, like, you know, it just wasn't even really, you know, the scientific community just sort of you know, dismissed it. it. It just wasn't actually up to the appropriate standards you know joe weber was not working with the appropriate standards but that's not something that would have been uh that would have been obvious to anybody unless they were immersed in the gravitational wave community and they had that sort of tacit understanding of what counted as good gravitational wave science um so so yeah i mean so so colin says well you, you know you can't uh, you can't learn science from you know, from primary sources, from popular expositions, or rather you can learn it, right? I mean, you, you know, you can have a basic understanding of it, but you can't learn it to the level that would be required in order to contribute to uh, scientific work. If you want to contribute to scientific work, you need to be immersed within a particular scientific community for a long time, and you need to pick up all of that tacit knowledge, all of those skills, abilities. Um, it's long-term immersion within the community. Um, and so just uh, another example that Collins gives of, of uh, what he calls interactional expertise uh, is uh, he, he notes that he did these uh, sort of Turing test type experiments where 
blind people successfully pretended to be sighted, um, but sighted people generally were not able to successfully pretend to be blind uh, because blind people live they are immersed in a community of sighted people. So, you know, they learn to sort of speak the language as it were, they learn to act the right way. They learn, you know, they learn what it is to be sighted. Um, they learn at least what, what it, how to act in a community of, of sighted people. Whereas sighted people, of course, generally are not immersed within blind communities. So they don't know that. Um, so anyway, uh, the point of all of this is that philosophers of science, generally speaking, don't have interactional expertise in scientific communities. Now, that's not, I mean, there are some who do, right? In fact, I'm uh, just re recently reading a book called Philosophy of Microbiology by Maureen O'Malley, and I'm pretty sure Maureen O'Malley w worked for many years in microbiology before writing this book. So there are certainly examples of uh, philosophers of science who began their academic careers within the sciences and they were immersed in the sciences, but actually many of them, many of them didn't. Um, you know, many of them maybe maybe they did. You know, they they sort of learned, yeah, science at school and all of that, and they've continued reading it. But uh, they haven't had that sort of long term immersion within an academic scientific community. That you know, so they don't have interactional expertise, um, and so this is perhaps a problem for uh, for a lot of the work that goes on in philosophy of science because it. It, it seems that if Collins is right about this, you know, if you want to contribute to understanding, for instance, the levels of selection or adaptationism, um, then no matter how much biology you read, no matter how many journals you read, no matter how many textbooks you read, you know, no matter how much you, you read about the biology, that's, that's not enough. Um, what you're actually going to have to do is get in with a community of biologists and spend a hell of a lot of time around them and you know learning their skills learning their abilities uh, and if you if you don't have that you're just not going to be able to make any contribution um so that would uh, yeah as i say that would maybe put uh, a lot of philosophy of science philosophers of science kind of out of business um you know, you know uh, because a lot of them just don't have that now, I should say that one thing Collins does point out is that um, it's often quite legitimate for scientists to consult people outside of the field of science. And this is when people have what he calls experience based expertise. So he gives this example uh, of after the Chernobyl explosion, there was this cloud of radioactive dust uh, and it, it landed in the Cumbrian fells and the sheep there became irradiated. Uh, and the uh, some ministry, the name I, I can't remember, it was some you know group of scientists basically. Uh, they analysed the situation. They instructed the farmers on what to do, and the farmers disagreed. Farmers said, "No, you don't know what you're talking about." And actually, the the consensus now, according to Collins anyway, is that actually the farmers uh, they had good points and they should have been listened to. Uh, now, the point here is, well, farmers are not are not laypersons, right? Farmers are experts. They're experts on sheep farming, right, in particular, which is so. So in this case, scientists were trying to advise people about how to deal with these radioactive sheep. Um, and they should have consulted the experts on sheep farming. So maybe one way of defending philosophy of science is to say, well, look, science makes philosophical presuppositions and philosophers are of course experts uh, with respect to philosophical presuppositions so so i mean so, so collins grants right that where scientific disputes uh, relate to the areas of expertise of other elite groups um it's important to hear the voices of those groups right collins collins accepts that so so maybe the philosophers could say well look many scientific disputes make these philosophical presuppositions so it's important for scientists to consult um expert philosophers now the issue here then is is well who counts as like an acceptable elite group who counts as an elite group that should be considered by scientists because there are many elite groups that scientists just want to ignore. So scientists will generally ignore um, astrologers or, you know, HIV denialists um, or theologians, right? You know, there's loads of groups that in general scientists just don't pay attention to. Um, so how do we decide who counts as uh, like, uh, 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 the, like the elite groups that are worth listening to?
So here's one thought. Well, the thing about sheep farmers is, like you can you can see that they are an elite group just by their practical results. Uh, science also, of course, has many striking practical results. You know, the incredibly accurate predictions, technological innovations, its use in engineering, and all of this. Um, but then it's it's the same for sheep farmers, right? If you want wool, you want food, etc., then you're going to have to rely on the expertise of sheep farmers. Their expertise is it's the kind of expertise that has these useful practical results in terms of achieving our goals. Um, and this is perhaps what distinguishes sheep farmers from, um, as I say, yeah, astrologers and uh, HIV denialists and theologians. Um, so in, in, I guess what, what many people would say is that in the case of a theologian, there just aren't really any like you know, practical results from that. I mean, I suppose it's, there's not really anything bad from it, but th there's, there's no kind of good practical use of the, the, theological expertise. Uh, as for HIV denialists, obviously in that case, uh, it's actively dangerous. I remember reading about a case where there was some magazine that was, the, the editorial board had like nine people with HIV who denied the claim that HIV caused AIDS. And so they didn't take HIV medication. And within a few years, all of them had died of, uh, of symptoms that we would say were very much like AIDS. Um, so, you know, so, so that kind of thing obviously is, is actively dangerous. In the case of something like theology, it's just, you know, useless, practically speaking. Um, so, so maybe uh, the, what, the way that we do this is just by, by, you know, looking at who has the practical results, right? Like scientists should listen to what sheep farmers have to say, where their disputes relate to sheep farming, because sheep farmers have these practical, successful results, um, but they can ignore astrologers and HIV denialists and theologians and so on. Of course, that raises the question of, you know, who decides what counts as successful results, because actually, astrologers would probably say that they do have good results, right? Astrologers would say, well, hey, we do make significant improvements in people's lives. Um, but actually, uh, I think there's no need to really uh, get into that question here because the question is, should scientists listen to philosophers? You know, should scientists listen to philosophers of science? Can philosophers of science contribute to the resolution of scientific disputes? And actually, I think we're pretty much all agreed that philosophy doesn't really have practical results, does it? You know, philosophers aren't really interested in solving uh, practical problems. Um, I mean, certainly in practice, scientists seem to get along fine without us. So we might want to say, oh, well, if you're doing a study on biodiversity, for example, then uh, you need to know how to count, like, you, you need to know how to uh, determine the species richness of a particular area and in order to determine the species richness you need to you need to know what counts as a species so that raises the species problem and your you know philosophers can make contributions to solving the species problem um but actually in practice it, it just doesn't seem to matter right scientists actually just seem to get along fine and they make they do perfectly good empirical research uh, without really paying any attention to what philosophers say uh, you know you don't you don't even you don't really need to solve the species problem as long as you define your terms like you don't need to say whether you are, we don't need to decide whether the right species criterion is say the biological species criterion or the ecological species criterion as long as you are as long as the scientists are clear about which criterion they are using so a lot of these kind of conceptual issues are largely irrelevant to empirical research so it, it seems like even philosophers would agree that philosophy doesn't tend to have practical applications. Um, and so if the, you know, if we determine what counts, who counts as an elite, gr elite group in terms of the practical applications, um, then philosophers don't count. And, uh, you know, again, philosophy of science is in trouble. Um, of course, there may be you know, other ways of determining who counts as an elite group, uh, who counts as you know, whose expert opinion uh, c counts. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's perhaps uh, an issue uh, for philosophers of science there. The philosophers of science just uh, don't have uh, interactional expertise, and maybe they also don't count as um, you know the kind of groups that that we would that would have something relevant to say about um, 
questions like the species problem and levels of selection and so on.